Okay, we're continuing on in our series from dream to destiny. I want you to get ready to turn to two passages of Scripture. We're going to look at Genesis chapter 39. This is the story of Joseph. I've told you during this series, I hope you'll go and read or listen to the Bible on your iPhone or iPad or whatever device you have. Listen, read chapters about Genesis 37 through about Genesis 47. It'd be great for you to read that during the series, but I want I want to go to Genesis chapter 39. And then for those of you that don't know it, maybe you're a new Christian, you don't even know what this is. Get ready and put this over in Hebrews chapter 3, because we're going to go there in a minute, okay? Uh, here's what I believe. I believe every person in the world has a dream from God. I believe that God has a dream for your life. And I believe everybody, every person has a destiny from God. A destiny that God wants you to fulfill. God has a destiny for you. But many, many people do not fulfill the destiny that God has on their life because of one simple word. The word is character. Their character will not support their destiny. And so God takes us through some character building tests while we're on this earth. And basically what we're doing here over the next few weeks is we're looking at the life of Joseph and we're seeing ten character tests that he went through so he could fulfill the destiny that God had on his life. So this is message number three. Last week we had a guest speaker. You probably don't even remember what we talked about the first two weeks, but I want to check to see if anybody's paying attention. Can you remember what the first two tests were? I hope you can remember. If you can't, ask your wife. She's probably got a better memory than you. The first week was, someone said it, the pride test. What Do you remember what we talked about the second week? The pit test. I love to know that my wife is paying attention. <laughs> You know, I got a message from a guy this week. He said, Pastor, he said, I just watched the pit test on the website. He said, I've been working Sundays and, and I hadn't been able to get to church. But, you know, I love to, to hear that when people can't get here, they either watch online during the 11 o'clock service. 96 people are watching right now. That's awesome. Amen. And, but, but if you don't know it, he puts, Pastor Ronnie puts the Sunday messages up usually by Wednesday, so you can go back and listen Sunday's message if you weren't here and you weren't able to watch online. But he watched the pit test and he said, Pastor, he said, that message spoke to me. I'm blown away at the te technology that we have in the world today. And listen, I'm old school. If it was up to me, we wouldn't have any of this stuff. But the younger generation, they said, look, we need this stuff, Pastor. So I say, go do it. And man, look what happens. 96 people watching online. That just blows me away. God is getting His Word out into all the earth. So this week is the palace test. We've had the pride test. We've had the pit test. Next week we're going to talk about the purity test. And then we're going to talk about the prison test. So listen, I want you to go right now to Genesis chapter 39, verse 1. This is the palace test. This is God's Word. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him from the Ishmaelites. Now we know they were Midianite traders. Midian was the region they were from, but Ishmael was the, the descendants that they were from. So uh, they bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. Now, I want you to look carefully at verse 2. The Lord was with Joseph, and he was a successful man. I really hope you see the connection there between those two phrases. The Lord was with Joseph, and he was a successful man. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw... Now remember, his master was an unbeliever. His master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all he 
he did to prosper in his hand. So Joseph found favor in his sight and served him. Then he made him overseer of his house, and all that he had he put under his authority. So it was from the time that he had made him overseer of his house, and all that he had, listen, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in the house and in the field. Thus he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he did not know what he had except for the bread which he ate. And then it says, Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. I like how the Bible says he was handsome in form and appearance. I think the reason it says that last verse is because I think they're about to go into the purity test on how Potiphar's wife pursued him. Just remember, next week is the purity test. We're going to talk about sexual immorality and what kind of junk it can cause in your life and in your family. Okay, here's what he's talking about here. This is an amazing statement. By the way, now, okay, he's in Potiphar's house and Potiphar makes him second in command and he gives him everything. He just says, I want you to run the whole thing and then he, and then he ends up in prison and then the keeper of the prison does the same thing. And then he ends up back in the palace and, and Pharaoh does the same thing. But right now I want to look down at the end of chapter uh, 39, verse 23. This was, was when he was in prison. And this is what it says. The keeper of the prison did not look into anything that was under Joseph's authority because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made it prosper. So I've got a real simple question for you today. Would it be okay with you, I mean, with whatever you do, that the Lord made it prosper? Would you kind of like that? Would you raise your hand if, if you want to, whatever you do, that the Lord would make it prosper? Okay, that's just about most of us in here. <clears throat> I want you to know this morning, I've got four simple keys to being successful to being prosperous, to being promoted in everything that we do. It doesn't matter if it's your job or, or your health or your finances, if it's your family or if it's your marriage. To be successful in whatever God's called you to do, whatever you put your hands to, i got four real simple keys. And I hope you write them down or take notes because they're, they're, they're simple and pro, but they're profound. The number one is this one. The key to prospering is the presence of the Lord. That's the key to prospering. The key to prospering is the presence of the Lord. Notice it said, how many times it said, the Lord was with him and he prospered. The first thing we need to talk about here is the word prosperity. It's not a bad word, okay? I know there's a lot of hyper-prosperity teachings, and I don't agree with them. I know that it's wrong. I know that you cannot support those hyper-prosperity teachings by Scripture. But here's the problem with all those hyper-prosperity teachings. It keeps preachers from really teaching on prosperity. I'm talking about the biblical term for prosperity. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Because usually when you talk about prosperity or money, people turn out, they tune out. They say, oh no, here comes the preacher again talking about money. But I'm telling you, God wants you to prosper. He wants to make you successful in your life and in your business and in your job and in your career, in your health, in your finances. God wants you to prosper so you can prosper others. Amen. God wants to bless you so you can bless others. That's what it's all about. God doesn't pass you the gravy so you can drown in the gravy. He passes you the gravy so you can get a little and pass the gravy. You gravy lovers are like, this is all my gravy. <laughs> Prosperity is not a bad word. Prosperity, it's all through the Scripture. Matter of fact, prosperity in the Hebrew literally means to push 
forward. That's what it means. To put, whoa, God, whoa, God. That's what it means. God wants to push you forward. Some of your employers try to push you forward because they want you to prosper. They want the company to do better so the company can do better. You can get a raise and you can get a bonus. But God wants to push you forward. God wants you to prosper. One of the times it was used in the Old Testament was when Samson, or really the Spirit of the Lord, came upon Samson and Samson defeated his enemies. In other words, what happened? God came on Samson and pushed him forward. Would that be all right with you if God just pushed you forward? <laughs> Would it be all right with you if God pushed you forward in your career? If God pushed you forward? I mean, just pushed you forward, just kept pushing you forward? I mean, that'd be all right with me. Let me tell you the key to prospering. The key to prospering is the presence of the Lord. Let me tell you why. God never fails. God never failed in anything He's ever done. If we walk with the presence of the Lord, or if we walk with God, we're going to prosper. Because God's going to prosper. Find out what God's doing and get in on it. Wherever God is going, you need to go. We tell single people all the time, you looking for a godly husband or a godly wife? Run after God with all your strength, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Look to the right, look to the left. If anybody's running beside you, they may be a candidate. But people try that for about a week and they say, oh, I don't like being alone. And then they go over to Booters or Cooters or Scooters or whatever it's called. And they go in there and look for a, a, a spouse or a mate. And they say, well, I, I'm going to pray that he gets saved or that she gets saved. That ain't going to happen. I mean, I hope it happens. But I see more marriages in and divorce because they got started wrong. Wherever God is going. Now here's the problem. People go out from the presence of the Lord. And it's not that God removes His presence. It's that we just walk away from the Lord. You know, the Bible says Cain went out from the presence of the Lord. It's what the Bible says. God came to Adam and He gave Adam the chance to repent. He came to Eve and gave Eve the chance to repent. He came to Cain and gave him a chance to repent. And Cain wouldn't repent. Cain went out from the presence of the Lord because God was walking one way and Cain just decided to walk another way. And that's what happens when we walk out of the presence of the Lord. When you walk with God, you're successful. When you don't walk with God, you're not successful. It's not rocket science. Let me give you a few scriptures to back this up. Stay in Genesis 39. I'm going to go through these real fast. Genesis 26, verses 12 and 13. Then Isaac sowed in that land, and he reaped in that same year a hundredfold. I mean, can you imagine if you sowed a seed and you reaped a hundredfold in the same year? You know, it's like Travis let us use his jackhammer. He sowed a seed to the church. You may get a hundred jackhammers this year <laughs> with a hundred men working on them. Can you imagine how big your business would be? I mean, why can't you reap a hundredfold? I mean, why not? He said, well, I don't know if I want that much blessing. If you'll just let God keep pushing you, you'll get that much blessing. That's how these guys get so big in business. It's because God pushed them forward. Now watch and see if God shies away from using the word prosperity. Just because of the hyper-prosperity teachers. Verse 13. The man began to prosper and continued prospering until he became very prosperous. Looks to me like it's in the Bible, right? Right? Come on. This is now Deuteronomy 29, verse 9. Therefore keep the words of this covenant and do them that you may prosper in all that you do. 2 Kings 18.7 I'm just going through the Bible, people. The Lord was with him. He prospered wherever he went. Then 
3 John verse 2. Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health, in health just as your soul prospers. I want you to know that God wants to push you forward in your career, in your family, in your marriage. God wants to push you forward. But so many times we kick back against God. Quit kicking against the goats. The Bible, Apostle Paul talks about that. The key to prospering is the presence of the Lord. Even an unbeliever, Potiphar was an unbeliever. He recognized that the Lord was with Joseph. And, 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 and that his house, Potiphar's house, was blessed because the Lord was with Joseph. Let me just ask you a real simple question. Does your employer, whether he's a believer or an unbeliever, does your employer believe that he's being blessed because you work for his company? Something to think about. That's what happened with Joseph. So the key to prospering is the presence of the Lord. So you might say, well, what's the key to the presence of the Lord then, Pastor? If that's it, I want to prosper. So what's the key to the presence of the Lord? I'm way ahead of you. I've got it all figured out. Here's point number two. The key to the presence of the Lord is obedience. The key to the presence of the Lord is obedience. Let me read you some Scripture. Back up point number two. 2 Chronicles 17, verse 3. Now the Lord was with Jehoshaphat because... Now it's going to tell us why the Lord was with him. The Lord was with Jehoshaphat because he walked in the former ways of his father David and he did not seek the Baals. B-A-A-L-S. Those are other gods. In other words, he obeyed. He walked in obedience. 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 14. And David behaved. Okay, we can stop right there. David behaved. Can we just start behaving? I mean, we can stop right there and end the sermon. Just behave and you'll be blessed. And David behaved wisely in all his ways and the Lord was with him. <laughs> now we know David didn't do everything right and we're not going to do everything right. But when David messed up, he repented. He came back to the Lord. He humbled himself. That's what repentance is. Humbling yourself under the mighty hand of God and saying, I've messed up. Sometimes you've got to go to people and say, I've messed up. Even when the prophet came, he humbled himself and he came back. 1 Samuel 18, verse 12. Now Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him, but had departed from Saul. Here's, here's two simple questions. Why was the Lord with David? Because he obeyed. He behaved. That's what we just read. And why had the Lord departed from Saul? Because he disobeyed. It's really simple. When you behave, are y'all listening? When you dis when you disobey, the Lord departs from you. But it's not that he really departs from you, it's that you walk away from him. Deuteronomy eleven, verse twenty six. I love that you said this over the offering because it's it's my scripture too. Behold, I set before you today a blessing and a curse. Now here's what God's saying right here. These aren't my words. I'm going I'm to let you choose. It's up to you, church. A blessing or a curse. What would you prefer? Verse 27. The blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today. And a curse if you do not obey the commandments of the Lord your God. Listen to me carefully. This is not a works doctrine. We're saved by grace through faith. We go to heaven by grace through faith. But if you want to succeed on this earth, you have to obey. If you obey and walk with God, you'll walk in success. It doesn't mean everything's going to always go right for you. It doesn't mean you're never going to go through a storm. But when you go through a storm, the Lord will be there with you and things will be successful. God will take you through these storms 
successfully. We're all, we all encounter storms. Y'all look at us and you don't think we've ever encountered a storm? We've been in some hurricanes. If you want to succeed on this earth, you're going to have to obey. If you'll obey and walk with God, you'll walk in success. Job 36, verse 11 and 12. If they obey and serve Him, or in other words, if they serve God, they shall spend their days in prosperity and their years in pleasures. But if they do not obey, they shall perish by the sword, and they shall die without knowledge. Pretty simple, isn't it? Proverbs 28, verse 13. He who covers his sins, in other words, he who walks in disobedience will not prosper. But whoever confesses or forsakes them or basically turns away from them will have mercy. How many of you want mercy? Man, I, I don't want what I deserve. I want mercy. You know that I, I believe in grace. I'm a grace preacher. But I, I believe so strongly that we're saved by grace. If it's based upon works, let's go home. We won't measure up. Let's shut the church down. Let's go to the golf course. Let's go to the ranch. Let's don't even have church if it's based upon works. We're saved by grace through faith. It's a gift from God. If it's based on works, you're already lost. You're already in trouble. Let me just assure you, grace is a gift of God. And it's a gift that cannot be earned. I believe in grace so strongly, but I so strongly believe in obedience. I've seen it in my life. When I walk with God in obedience, I'm blessed. Everything I put my hands to is blessed. When I walk away from God, there's a curse. And listen to me, it's not God cursing me. We live in a cursed world. It's like I said Wednesday night, it's like we have a hell storm going on around us with big old chunks of hell falling from the sky, but we have this steel umbrella over God and, and whoever walks with God. So when we walk with God, this thing protects us. We're protected. We're blessed. We're covered. But when we choose to walk away from God, when we choose to walk out there in the hell storm, and we think we can dodge the hell, but you can't. The hell is going to hit you right on the forehead when you disobey. So the key to prospering is the presence of the Lord. The, the key to the presence of the Lord is obedience. Now here's what some of you are thinking, because I know how you think. I just don't obey. I'd like to obey, Pastor, but I just don't. If I'm going to obey, I'm going to need the key to obedience. Well, guess what? I've got that for you. I've got that covered. Here's the key to obedience. Here's point number three. The key to obedience is faith. The key to obedience is faith. You know why a farmer plants a seed? Because he believes he's going to receive a reward. Many of us have more faith in stream energy than we do in God. Because what happens? We walk in a room and we flip on the switch and we know the lights are going to come on. Or we have more faith in the hot water heater than we have in God. Because we know when we turn the hot water valve on, eventually the water's going to get hot. We get in the shower and we turn the hot water on and we wait. I had a house one time, you tur I'd, I'd turn it on from outside and I'd wait. Because it was like the hot water heater was two doors down. And eventually, but it would get hot and I'd step into it. I mean, I mean, you know what I'm talking about? If you'll turn the faucet of obedience on, it may feel cold, but eventually it's going to get hot. You have to believe. Now here's the problem. We don't believe that there are rewards. If we obey, there's rewards. And there are consequences if we disobey. And here's why I know this. 
If we believed that, we would obey. Many times we feel like we can disobey and get away with it. We can't. You don't get away with it. You know the reason why children obey is they believe they're going to be rewarded if they obey. And they'll, they believe they're going to suffer consequences if they disobey. Ephesians chapter 6 verses 1 through 3. Children, obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. What's a promise? It's a reward. That it may be well with you and that you may live a long life on the earth. I've asked people before, what's the promise if you obey or honor your parents? And then everybody will say, you get to live a long life. But that's, not, that's just part of it. The promise is that things may go well with you. If you think about it, you might not even want to live a long life if things aren't going well with you. You see, there's a reward that, that things may go well with you when you obey. This is, listen to me. Children believe that they'll be rewarded if they obey. And if they believe there are consequences when they disobey, let me just tell you what the book of Proverbs tells us. Those are consequences. You know what the consequences children are when you disobey? A spanking. My wife said, don't talk about that too much. A lot of people don't believe in spanking. Well, they don't believe God's Word. Now, I'm not into child abuse. Hey, Proverbs 23, 14 says, He who spanks his child delivers his soul from hell. That's quoted right out of the Bible. In my kid, in my house, my kids obey. You want to know why? Because they believe. I help them believe with the paddle. I built faith into their lives. But I don't just believe in consequences, I believe in rewards too. I've taken my kids and I said, you know what? We're going to go get something for you today. And they're like, why? Because you've been doing good. You've been obeying. And I can remember things I've bought my kids over the years just to reward them for doing right, for doing good. God is a rewarder if you believe. You know, if you work hard for your employer, even though if he's, if he's an unbeliever, if you believe that if you worked hard that God would reward you, then you'd be a good worker. But I'm telling you, there's a lot of people that say this to me. When I get a better job, or when I work for a better person, then I'll work harder. No, you won't. You won't get a better job. If you're not faithful with where you are, why would God want to give you more? I've got the Scripture to back it up. Listen to this. Colossians chapter 3, verse 22. Bond servants, obey in all bond servants. You could, you, you, that could say employees. Employees, obey in all things your bosses according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in sincerity of heart, fearing God. And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. For you serve the Lord Christ. But he who does wrong will be repaid for what he has done. And there's no partiality. You need to listen to this. This is important. Now turn to Hebrews chapter 3. I'm taking a little bit more time on this than I wanted to, but I think it's important. All of us want to obey. We want to do the right thing. But how do you obey? Well, you, you, you obey if you have faith. So in Hebrews chapter 3, when I read this scripture, when I read it, it was like, there it is, right there. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 18. And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest? In other words, this is the reward of the promised land. Who would not, who would not receive the reward of the promised land? But to those who did not obey. So you're not going to receive the reward of the promised land if you don't obey. 
Now watch this carefully. Look at verse 19. It says, So we see that they could not enter in because of what? Watch this. Because of unbelief. Where did that word come from? He was talking about obeying. And you would think that it would say, those that did not obey could not receive the reward. So we see that they could not receive it because they did not obey, but it says they did not believe. That's what the word unbelief means. So listen to me. Faith produces obedience. If they had believed God would reward them, then they would have obeyed. They disobeyed because they didn't believe. And that's why we disobey. Listen to me. Faith produces obedience. So the, the key to prospering is the presence of the Lord. Because if you're walking with God, God always succeeds. The key to the presence of the Lord is obedience. The key to obedience is faith. Some of you are thinking right now, well, what's the key to faith? I'm telling you, it's so practical, it's so simple. I promise you, every one of us can do it. You'll choose whether you want to prosper or not. It won't be my fault, it won't be the church's fault, it won't be your parents' fault, it won't be your boss's fault. It won't have anything to do with how you were brought up. You choose whether you are blessed or not. You choose whether you want to prosper or not. Whether you want to walk in the presence of God or not. Whether you're going to obey or whether you're going to have faith because it's right here. What I'm going to share with you, you can do. Any of us can do this. Here's point number four. The key to faith is hearing God's Word. The key to faith is hearing the Word. The key to faith is hearing the Word. Listen to me, you have to hear the Word. Listen to as many sermons as you can. Pastor Ronnie's always got his earphones in, working around the church, listening to sermons. I listen to sermons where I'm driving to and from. I'm listening to biblical preachers that teach and pre preach biblical principles. I don't listen to all these health and wealth and prosperity deals. You do three things and hold your foot in the air, and put nose on your oil on the end of your nose, and send this letter in, and you're going to be blessed. I don't listen to all that junk. I listen to biblical teaching and preachers, preachers from God's Word, sound doctrine, and then I apply it to my life. This is why we put our messages up on the website so you can go back and listen to them when you've missed them. We need to walk in unity as a body, as a church. We need to know what God's saying through the preacher, through the worship. We need to be assembling together. The book of Hebrews talks about it. We want to get the Word in you. We want you listening to other preachers too. Biblical preachers. Memorize the Word of God. Drive down the road listening to it on your iPod or iPhone or however you want to get it. I hit a button and it comes through my car from my phone. That's amazing to me. He showed me how to do it. <laughs> Put it. Do it old school. Get you some little cards. Write out verses on cards. Carry them in your back pocket. Memorize Scripture. Stick it on your bathroom window. Don't put it. Move it over to the side so you can see yourself when you're brushing your teeth. But stick it on your bathroom window. Memorize on your bathroom mirror. Memorize the Word of God. Trust in the Lord with all that heart. I mean, you know, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Remember, get, memorize the Scripture. Get it in you. Here's what the Bible says. Hearing the Word builds faith in you. Listen to me. The Word has the power to change your life. The Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And the name is the Word of God. His name is the Word of God. And the Word of God is not corruptible seed, but incorruptible seed, which lives and abides forever. In, in, in heaven and earth will pass away, but His Word will never pass away. And it never returns void without accomplishing what it was set out to do. Listen to the Word of God. Get it in you. Know the Word of God. I can't impress upon you any stronger. Spend time with the Word. Get to know the Word. He is the Word. 
Jesus is the Word. I want you to think about these last three points. We talked about prospering in the presence of the Lord. We talked about obeying, having faith, that's obeying, or believing. And then we talked about hearing the Word. You want to experience more of the presence of the Lord? If you really want to experience more of the presence of the Lord, hear, believe, and obey. It's not hard. Hear, believe, and obey. You can prosper because you're walking with God. You're going to walk with God because you obey. You're going to obey because you believe. But you believe and have faith because you hear God's Word. That's how simple it is. When I was a fairly new Christian, her dad, my pastor, he would always say, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word. I wanted to have more faith. I wanted to have greater faith. I wanted to believe. I, I wanted to know how to do this. So I took him at his word. I went to the bookstore and I bought the Bible on cassette tapes. I would open them up, start right there in the book of Genesis. I'd stick it in the cassette player and I would drive from job to job listening to the Bible in my truck. And I'm convinced today I'm the pastor of Journey Church because I got the word in there as a new Christian, got it in my body, in my life. It built faith in me. It takes faith to be a pastor. It takes faith to believe God for the supernatural. It takes faith to have vision. I got the word in me at a younger, when I was first, when I was a brand new Christian. But I still, today, you don't arrive at this place where you got it all. You, you keep growing in God. I listened to the New Testament this week, the book of John. Back and forth to, to new, uh, Port Rangers, where I'm working. On the way to church this morning, I listened to two books of Genesis. On the way in this morning. I'm not against Christian music, but I want the Word. Where I'm going with God, i got to have the Word in me. I've got to know the Word. I've got to believe the Word. I've got to have great faith. It comes from getting in the Word of God. I said this in the first service, and I wasn't, really wasn't going to say it in the second service, but I believe I got to. I look at the tithing record of people that lead departments at Journey Church, of our staff, of my son. And the reason why I do is because when I see someone's treasure has left the church, then I know their heart has left the church. Because the Bible says where their treasure is, their heart is. So, this kid has an anointing on his life to prosper. And the reason why he has the anointing to prosper is because he's been in the Word. See, for the last 10 years of our life, we've, we've tried to live and apply God's Word every day in our life. We haven't done it perfectly, but we've been doing that for 10 years now. Now, before that, I didn't. I wasn't a tithe. Matter of fact, when I gave an offering, I, I felt like I was tipping God. And I really like to give when you could see me. Because it made me feel good about me. You know, that's how I received my affirmation. Well, look at him, man. He put $200 in the play. Yeah, I was doing that for me. I didn't know anything about God's principles, God's Word. I gave with the wrong motives, with the wrong heart. I wanted to see, be seen by men. God's changed our lives. We've come out of Egypt. At a young age, he said, Daddy, why? Why, why do you write those checks to the church like that? He used to sit on the front row with me when I'd write the check. I'd say, son, because I used to be in Egypt. I was in bondage. I had all kinds of problems. I was a mess. And God set me free. And now I just bring back to God what He so freely gives to me. I mean, and He's seen that model in His life. So guess what? He starts getting an age. All of a sudden, He starts a business. He says, Dad, I made these cards, Grayson Photography. We gave him a camera for his birthday or Christmas. He started shooting pictures. He started doing uh, class, uh, what do you call it? Class pictures for people when they were graduating. He started doing weddings. He started, people started paying him. And I started watching him write his time check out at a young age. I was blown away by it. Just recently, last week, he, he got a check in the mail. Mailbox money. 
came out of nowhere. Put a tie in a, in, in this generation does it online. And I get a notice. And when it comes on my phone, it says, Grace and Beard, just tied. And I say, that's my boy. And, and I know, I know, I know he's, he's anointed to prosper because of God's word. It's, it's, it's not because he's special, he's a pastor's kid. It's because he's applying God's word to his life. So, Lord, I don't want to go here right now. Sometimes people come to me and they say, Pastor, pray for me. I'm having a real tough time. And then I go check their tithing record and I know why they're having a tough time. Because you're voluntarily placing yourself under a curse. You say, well, I don't know if I believe that. Listen to me. Listen to me. I've had people say to me, Pastor D, I believe in tithing, I just don't do it. That's really absurd. I believe in it. I believe in it, I just don't do it. If you believed in it, you would do it. If you believed that tithing would remove the curse off of your family and that God would rebuke Satan for your benefit and that He would open up the windows of heaven and bless you, then you would do it. That is the Word of God that I just said. Can I just say to everybody here today that doesn't tithe, you really don't believe the Bible. And don't tell me you do. Because you don't. Can I just say God says test Him in this area? It's the only place in the Bible where God says test me in this area. Now listen, I'm not mad at you. I'm not mad at you. Don't feel condemned if you don't tithe. I want to teach you something. I want you to grow spiritually. I want you to prosper in everything you put your hands to. I want you walking with the favor of God on your life. God says you can test Him in this area. The area of tithing. Many people say to me, and they, and they really believe that they should do it. They believe that they should do it, but they believe they believe in it, but they don't. But they, but they don't do it, so they don't believe in it. And then people say to me, "I can't afford to tithe." Listen to me. You'll never be able to afford to tithe until you start tithing. As long as you don't tithe, you're under a curse, and the devourer has open access to your finances. That it's biblical. Every time you start to get ahead, something will go wrong. And you'll have a setback. And most of you would agree with that. Those of you that don't tithe. But you'll never be able to afford to tithe until you tithe. Because tithing is what removes the curse. So I'm begging you, start obeying God. Obey God's Word. Grayson has a prosperity blessing on his life because he's a tither and he's a giver. Money doesn't own him. He knows it comes from God. He knows God's Word. Grace is blessed. And so are some of the other young people in this church. I've got a guy here that plays drums that's a welder. This man's tithing. He's a night. He's, he's 20 something now, but he's been tithing since he got his first check. You know how how grateful it is for a heart, the heart of a pastor to see, see youth that came up in his youth group and see them applying God's principle to their life and watch God bless them. I mean, it, it just blows me away. I want this for you. I want your marriage to prosper. I want your finances to prosper. I want, I, as your pastor, I want to help you. I'm not mad at you. I want you to be successful. Listen, if you're visiting today, this doesn't apply to you. Well, it does to wherever your home church is. But if this is your church home and you're planted here, obey God's Word. Start tithing. A tithe is 10%. It's 10%. You make $100, you give 10. You make $1,000, you give 100. It's real simple. Whatever you make, it's from God. The key 
key to prosperity is the presence of the Lord. The key to the presence of the Lord is obedience. The key to obedience is having faith. The key to having faith is hearing God's Word. Come on. Come on, guys. We can do this. This is not about tithing. It's about being blessed. It's about living in the palace, acting like a child of the king. I mean, you're, you're, you're a king's kid. And it applies to every one of us. I'm not any better than you. You can have the blessing of God on your life. You just got to walk in the presence of the Lord. Be obedient. 